Good afternoon. And welcome. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Art Levine. I'm the Senior Vice Chancellor for the Health Sciences and the Peterson Dean of the School of Medicine. And in that role, I'm delighted to have the opportunity now to introduce Dr. Patricia Brennan, Director of the National Library of Medicine. As part of the National Institutes of Health, the NLM is the world's largest biomedical library and developer of electronic information. Countless scientists, health professionals, members of the public rely on its wealth of information every day all around the world. Dr. Brennan has been the NLM director since August of 2016, as the virtual library has expanded its capacity for data science. As part of the strategic plan for the NLM, it will be more than a resource for information storage and retrieval. While that role remains critical, the NLM will grow as a platform for biomedical discovery through the harnessing of data. Dr. Brennan was previously the Lillian Molman Bascom Professor at the University of Wisconsin School of Nursing and College of Engineering. She also led the Living Environments Laboratory at the Wisconsin Institutes for Discovery, which develops new means of visualizing complex data. Patricia has an extensive background developing information systems aimed at patient care and the management of personal health records. She developed the Computer Link Electronic Network to improve self-care among home care patients and the Heart Care Web-Based Information and Communication Service to support and to improve at-home recovery for cardiac patients. Dr. Brennan received her master's degree in nursing from the University of Pennsylvania and her industrial engineering PhD from the University of Wisconsin. She is past president of the American Medical Informatics Association, and she has been elected to the National Academy of Medicine. So please join me now in welcoming Dr. Patty Brennan. begin with an apology. A friend came back from Asia and brought me a gift. It's in my throat. And it's been there for two weeks, but it's almost gone. Um, I will do my best, though, to not hack away at you too much. Now I will begin with thanks. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks to Dr. Levine for the introduction, um, and also for your service to the National Library of Medicine. Dr. Levine led one of our strategic planning panels um, in the, in, during the process I'll be describing to you in a few minutes more and um, actually was brave enough to lead the first one and was brave enough to lead it surrounded by some of the brightest minds in the world and brought together a foundation for discovery that's really important to us. I want to thank Barbara Epstein for inviting me to be here. Uh, Barbara and I have developed a colleagueship over the last two years. In my role as the director of the National Library of Medicine, I work quite closely with the Medical Library Association and we'll try our best to align our goals, to make sure that we recognize that to ensure the health of society, we are able to bring the talents and skills and human resource of medical librarians and medical librarianship to the country. I've appreciated the interaction, some of them challenging on both ways, I suspect, many of them uh, warm. Uh, and finally, I, I want to acknowledge Jackie Dunbar Jacobs, where there she is, who has been a colleague of mine I can't believe she's been dean for 17 years. I thought it was only 12. But Jackie, very early on, uh, encouraged my thinking about human uh, response, about uh, coping, about thinking about how technology was going to assist in people being able to live more fully. And so I, I thank you for all the things that you've given me all the years and all the things that you've done over the years. Um, my colleagues from the medical informatics department here, nice to be back. We were just visiting here earlier. To, uh, to look at one of our training programs from the, around the country, and the colleagues from the School of Nursing, uh, thank you again for, for doing what I am no longer able to do, and that is make sure that the workforce for nursing stays vibrant. And finally, thanks to the National Library of Medicine people who are here on a boondoggle, or are you working? I'm not sure which one, but you seem to be happy. Um, we are here today uh, primarily because we're working with the Regional Medical Library and the National Network of Libraries of Medicines support for a program called the All of Us Program. I'm going to be coming back to that several times. But the All of Us Program is 
a, an initiative that was envisioned under President Obama that has been carried forth through the leadership of Francis Collins and of Eric Dishman to create a repository, a registry of a million persons, their everyday experience, their genomic, their health status, and use this as a basis for discovery and research. We are so excited to have this happening at the NIH, but I can tell you right now, this project could not happen without the National Library of Medicine. And it's for one key reason. In order to engage a million people in clinical observations, in self-monitoring over long periods of time, we must have places where those people can learn about health. And those are our public and health science and hospital libraries. Importantly, the All of Us program has as its commitment to return to individuals every part of their research results. So the individuals who participate in the genomic screening, which will be a subset of the total of a million patients, will receive back their genome, their GWAS, will be in their hand. Now they've got to do something with it, and I guarantee in the seven minutes they have with their primary care practitioner, they're not going to be able to go through it in enough depth. So our librarians, our public libraries, our hospital libraries, our health science libraries are preparing to be ready to answer questions to help people understand, to help them know what to do next. Now, you might think this is a little odd for a public library, a hospital library, or a health science library to be deeply involved in the health of individuals. But I will tell you, ask any librarian, particularly a public librarian or the librarian in the bookmobile, have you ever had to talk to a person about a health issue? They all have. Very often, the patient the person, the patron comes in, with a folded up piece of paper saying, my doctor says I have this, what is it? And the librarian is the first person to have to say, it's important, it's serious, it's scary, and walk them through that. Our job at the National Library of Medicine is to equip those librarians with the skills to not only look at the scary stuff, but at the positive things about people's health during the All of Us program. The All of Us program is a fantastic program that could not exist without the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. 6,800 points of presence around the country. The NLM does not only exist in Washington, D.C., in Bethesda, on that beautiful campus in our amazing building. It exists in 6,800 places around the country. That means your mother, your cousin, your neighbor who has a question has a place to go where they're not going to ask to see an insurance card first where they're not going to ask to see a driver's license or an identity card. Questions can be answered. Excuse me. Those of you who haven't shut your phones off, shut them off. Mine's going off, too. <laughs> we must be able to recognize that the National Library of Medicine supports libraries around the country, and that's what we're here to talk about today. I'm going to be talking about our strategic plan, which is focused on the transformation of data into knowledge, and as you well know, the NIH commitment, transforming knowledge into health remains an important and strong activity. But our strategic plan is designed to reach many stakeholders, and today I'm going to be making particular reference to our regional medical libraries and the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. Like all good universities, institutions, businesses, and federal government, the National Library of Medicine has been driven by a strategic plan. Once every 10 years, we develop a strategic plan. This year, our strategic plan was delayed a little bit because they were waiting for my arrival in the fall of 16. Betsy Humphreys and the team before me put together an outstanding group of individuals to help us on our journey to create the strategic plan. Our strategic plan for the National Library of Medicine took two, almost two full years to develop. It was approved by our Board of Regents in February of this year. It required the input of four national panels, one of them led by Dr. Levine, it required the input of one of our internal panels, our leaders, our, our staff coming together to deliberate over what they had heard. We had public input from over 500 individuals through meetings like this, through papers, uh, scraps in an, in, a, in an envelope at the end of some community meetings, through a web-based interface. We heard and we listened and we heard many things. What we heard fundamentally is the library that worked in the, to support the ICU in 1995 is not going to support the family at home in the community in 2025. We must become a different library. We must become an engine for discovery. We must accelerate biomedical discovery in the context of everyday living, and we must make sure we have the workforce for the future. 
Our strategic plan, therefore, led us to be resting now on three pillars that will guide the next decade of the National Library of Medicine. First, accelerate discovery and advance health through data-driven research. Second, to reach more people in more ways through enhanced dissemination and engagement. And third, to build a workforce for data-driven research and health. Now, the National Library of Medicine is a half a billion dollar operation. A lot of our activities have gone on for over 180 years. We will continue our key activities, but this will be our focus for the next 10 years. Let's go through them in some depth. First, to accelerate discovery and advanced health through data-driven research. We're all aware of the data tsunami that's about us. And you may, many of you have already made great use of the resources of the National Library of Medicine, including our resources such as dbGaP and GenBank, which house the international nucleotide sequences. We have already been an engine for discovery and data-driven health, but what we realize is that to go into the process of discovery, we must come out of the data repository into the hands and the minds of investigators. So to accelerate discovery and advance health through data-driven research requires that we stimulate the, the development of new methodologies for discovery. We need to enhance our, sk our skills for curation at scale. We need to develop the tools for open science because data-driven discovery no longer will respect the edge of a data space or the edge of a country. Data-driven discovery requires that we think of free-flowing data throughout the whole research process. I'd like you to think about this as fostering an ecosphere of, dis of discovery. The globe that you see on the right-hand side identifies some of the products and processes of research, protocols and models, instruments and pathways. The National Library of Medicine is, com is committed to not only addressing the literature in the right-hand uh, uh, right oval that's um, uh, mustard color, but it's committed to developing in-depth repositories of protocols, of codes, of individual participant data from clinical studies, of people and research participants, of instruments, of pathways that can be reused. And importantly, where our sweet spot is, is on the connection between those ovals. So we will structure underneath the ovals and we will connect across them. We will build pathways, we will build discovery tools, we will build, make it possible for an inquirer, a person or a machine, to enter the research process of discovery from any point and be connected to other points of the study. We believe that digital research objects emerge across the entire process of the, of the research event. And we must begin by indexing from the beginning, by creating early study protocols, collecting documents for uh, assuring that patients, human subjects have been, have been respected. We will create this, and it will not be in a single space. It will be accessible globally and worldwide. We recognize that in order to do this, we must assure data science and open science proficiency. From a technical perspective, that means making sure that identity and access management resources that allow an individual to safely and securely explore data sets without violating the rights of an individual participant to know what data sets are available will be managed from a technological as well as a human perspective. The National Library of Medicine already is early out of the box with open science in the sense that since, nine, since 2005 we have had PubMed Central, our repository of full text literature. Over five million citations are available in PubMed Central now. PubMed Central citations are the reports of, first of all, any NIH study uh, reports must be deposited for public access, but there, we also serve and support 11 other institutions, including the Howard Hughes Medical Investigators, including the EPA, and including several private foundations. Our resources have already been committed to openness, so you can come and look, and to the extent possible, for about half of our resources actually text mine across them to begin to discover new activities. But that's not enough. We have to build tools that make it possible, and we have to build the skill sets in individuals to inspire the use of open science. We've been experimenting with hackathons. We've been experimenting with science for society to ensure that data science and open science proficiency no longer remains the purview of the professional, but also becomes a tool in the hands of the consumer that individuals, that businesses, that communities can use these tools, use this knowledge to better understand themselves 
and proceed to their future. Our second pillar is to reach more people in more ways through enhanced dissemination and engagement. Now, the National Library of Medicine enjoys a very positive reputation. I have to say, it's nice to come into a venerable institution that's 180 years old and know that basically the people who know us like us, and they like us pretty well. Every once in a while, they get annoyed with some interface, like that DB gap thing is annoying. But fundamentally, people like us. But what we don't know is what the people who don't know about us might like about us if we could reach them. We need to find new ways. We need to reach more people. We recognize that engagement with individual, their thinking, their community, their conversation, their teams are important. But remember, now, how many of you have done a PubMed search? Okay, there you go. So you know us, and you like us, right? <laughs> but you read the same listing of articles, not the same content, but the same list, the same way the person in the next carol did, the same way the doc in the ER did, the same way the mom that's awake at 2 in the morning with the sick kid did. We show the same list, the same structure to everyone. That's not good enough anymore. We need to find ways to make those lists more meaningful to the user. We need to understand how the user is feeling at this moment in time. We need to understand, are they experienced in this area and they're looking for one particular citation, or are they brand new and they're exploring a new area? So we need to have enhanced engagement with our users without forcing them to click and profile themselves extensively. We've started to develop some of these tools already. So we developed something called a known item search. One of the things that our NCBI team who runs PubMed was finding was that many times an individual knew the exact article they were looking for. They didn't have the full citation, and maybe they didn't have the author list. So they would type in eight, nine, or ten words into the search box. Now the librarians in the room know what happened next. It defaults to a concatenation of every word in that sentence. So you get a bazillion citations, none of which are helpful to you. So the team developed the insight that maybe if there's more than five words in a row, that the search engine should recognize this might be a title. And let's provide a title-based search first. So there's only one or maybe two articles that come back. So we can tell a little bit from behavior how to respond. And this has been a very widely accepted resource, and people are really quite excited about it. But we have to go further. We have to know more. And we have to learn some new ways to know more. Maybe it's through a galvanic skin response. Maybe it's through a retinal scan. I'm not sure exactly why I want my computer listening to me when I'm doing a search. But I sure would like it to know better how I'm doing and what I'm going after. We need to reach young people in ways that we currently don't reach them. My son is 25. He doesn't email me anymore. He certainly doesn't call me anymore. He doesn't even text very much. He Instagrams. Well, we don't deliver any PubMed citations through Instagram right now. But we need to figure out if we have a, a generation growing up that Instagrams, how we Instagram our search results back to them. We don't have that figured out yet. We have to learn that. And we're learning this by enhancing our information delivery. We're enhancing our information delivery with two key investments that will continue to grow. On the right-hand side is a representation of standards. The National Library of Medicine has been an upholder and a, a convener and a purveyor of standards in the United States and now globally for over 20 years. SNOMED, <coughs> excuse me, RxNorm, LOINC, we make sure that the standards needed to ensure demonstration of meaningful use or interoperability of clinical record systems are available and accessible without charge. So price is not a barrier. We will continue and enhance advancing our investment in standards. We've begun to adopt all of our tools to a fire standard to make sure they become interoperable in the current data exchange model. On the left-hand side, you see a reference to PubMed Labs. What we've learned is we have to be constantly improving our systems. So we've developed a parallel universe for PubMed called PubMed Labs. You can see it now if you Google PubMed Labs. It'll take you to our experimental site. That's where we're testing out new ways to engage with you. That's where we're testing out a very important advance we've got going on right now, which is the, to provide re relevance-based ranked searches. So instead of providing your searches in reverse chronological order, most recent first, we now provide a relevance-based ranking, which is a, a basically the product of a machine algorithm that looks at the portfolio of titles that you've identified, plus your previous two screens of searching, and gives you a relevance space that is a reordering of your citations based on what we think might be closest to you. Some people are really liking this a lot. But you know what we found out? Two important things through this process. One of them is about 
40% of our searches are what we would call chauffeured searches, searching for somebody else. It's a graduate student looking for the professor. It's a mom looking for the grandma. It's the librarian looking for someone else. So if we're going to provide search results to who we think the intended user is, we've got to remember there's a screen in between. And so we have to figure out, is that person searching for someone else or for themselves? Second, and, and I think this is a, is a little bit more critical, when we look at the way we provide results to individuals, we assume that person's a solo practitioner all by themselves. Any researchers in the room, do you work alone? By yourself, never taught? No, we are a team science. The current research process of the world is becoming a team sport. And we need to start thinking about how we present our, race, our references to individuals who are part of teams so that we can understand the context of their mental framing. Importantly, we don't just present to people. We present information to machines all of the time, all day long. We have about 5 million individuals hitting our servers every day. Uh, we have another 3 million APIs that are hitting our servers, and they're going to be growing. So our machine-to-machine -machine interaction and our machine-to-machine -machine delivery of information is growing, and yet there's no watermark on that data as it's being delivered. The machine can't tell who's sending that out, and we want the ultimate end user of that material to trust this is an NLM inside piece of material. This is a data set curated by the National Library of Medicine. This clinical trial was registered at the NLM. So we're working on ways to implant our data sets, implant our, our recognition in, the, in our electronically delivered resources. Fundamentally, the most important asset the National Library of Medicine has is that it is a reliable, trustable source of health information and biomedical data. And I am completely committed to this being our foundational principle as we go through our strategic plan. We must never violate the trust of the scientific and lay public in the quality and the integrity of our data. We must never violate the, in, the, the ability of a clinician to make a decision based on information we present. <clears throat> Excuse me. About 20 minutes after the inauguration 18 months ago, I received a text from a librarian who said, okay, now how do we trust that you're telling us everything that you have? Suggesting that in fact there was a shift in federal priorities for disclosure of information. I will tell you today and for my entire tenure at the NLM, I will not be in any way violating the public's trust to get complete, concise, relevant, contemporary information. And we have the complete support of the NIH behind us for this. So you can trust us for now. This we recognize through our strategic plan is more important than the millions of citations we could serve up or the number of databases, the fact that our trust is there. Our third pillar is to build a da workforce for, for data-driven research and health. When we think about building a workforce for data-driven research and health, we almost immediately think about our training programs. And that, in fact, we are committed to enhancing our training program for biomedical science and data science. We are committed to ensuring the growth of our T15 programs and partnership with the NIH and the T32 programs for data science so that we can have the workforce that can build generalizable, scalable, sustainable analytical tools so that we can complement the work that is done in what we would consider our categorical institutes, heart, lung, and blood, and CI. Those, the data science that goes on in those areas solves problems specific to those domains. The National Library of Medicine's commitment is to build scalable, sustainable, reusable tools for the by, <clears throat> excuse me, biomedical data scientists. But, but remember, we must train across society. We must make sure that a bench scientist whose primary concern is the phenomenon of the biology she's studying that can use our tools without needing to stop the biological process so they can learn the analytical project. We must make sure that data science tools are available to the clinicians. And we've done sort of a dirty trick with those clinicians. After 20 years of getting them to believe in evidence-based practice, we're changing the basis of evidence. We have to help them come along with us to understand that data-driven discovery provides a complementary but fundamentally different set of recommendations and results than does an analytical study or an experimental study. And we must get tools into the hands of patients of lay people so that they can use these tools to make the choices for their life. We started a new initiative in the spring of 
2017 called Patient Libraries. This is an extramural program, R01 level funding, to make sure that data science tools become available to individuals. And we're doing marvelous things with them. One, an investigator in Ohio is building a data integrator for children transitioning out of foster care into independent care. Children who've been cared for by five, six, seven different healthcare systems over the first 15 years of life now have a tool that summarizes their growth and development so that it can be better used. We want to use technology to improve data-driven health. So wait, watch with me for a minute. Let me show you what we think data-driven health will look like. data-driven health should become a component of everyday health experience for individuals, whether they are alone or in the clinical care facility. But in order to do that, as I indicated so far, we have to think about some of our old strategies and new ways. The first one is we have to think about new users and new ways to reach them. To think about new kinds of access mechanisms that might be on a laptop in the home, or as you look at the second image, where you see a nutrition label hovering over a container of orange juice so that an augmented reality display of information is available at the moment that data are needed. Using virtual reality to interact with and engage for research planning or augmented reality to understand wayfinding in a community. These are all tools that we can bring information into the lives of people that becomes actionable at that moment in time. But it will not only be a technological change, we do need to recognize the human enterprise and reaching people wherever in part requires that we understand the human network and this is where our national network of libraries of medicine is particularly important. Our national network of libraries of medicine is organized into eight regions. These eight regions provide a connection point, a nexus for these local public libraries, hospital libraries, and health science libraries to share best practices, to learn new, the new, latest NLM resources that are being built. We also provide some technical consulting centers, technical assistance centers to those libraries so that each one doesn't have to develop its own structure for web-based interaction or for training. These provide us a way with introducing people to our wonderful electronic resources, many of which are present up here on the screen, many of which will continue. So we are not sunsetting any of our major resources, but what we are committed to do is to create the 21st century collection where advanced curation and effective information delivery becomes a part of everyday practice. This is requiring that we start kicking the tires of some of our venerable systems like dbGaP or PubMed to make sure the technical infrastructure is robust enough. It requires that we take the over 300 curators that work at the National Library of Medicine, 300 people curating the information we get from the clinicaltrials.gov declaration to new literature to a new dbGaP sequence and find what is common across those curators so we can make a robust training group as well as what is unique and what we have to strengthen within them. We need to create the 21st century collection. The 21st century collection is going to look very different than the 20th century collection in some important ways. We need to have ways to develop innovative attribution. Right now, an author of an article is clearly identified. That work is attributed to that individual or that team. But how do we attribute a well-curated data set or a sophisticated model? What is the attribution model there? We have to develop one. We need to rely more on automated indexing. The National Library of Medicine indexes 800,000 new citations every year. That's two a minute. That means we've had 60 new citations indexed since you walked into this room. You are behind in your reading. We cannot assume that the future is going to be run through the eyes of individuals, so we need to help develop personalized presentation and delivery of our resources. But fundamentally, our resources will be, will be characterized by three different activities. First, we will be the custodians of some of our resources. The National Library of Medicine as a federal library serves as the, the custodian, the permanent library, the permanent resting place 
for resources that are, need to be held in perpetuity. So we have in our collection a, a, a version of Abyssinia's medical text from the 11th century. We have 10th century Chinese manuscripts. We have 18th century European descriptions of plants. We also have journals that go back as far as the 1700s and go forward to last week. We, have, we are the curator, but increasingly, we own fewer things. Most of our journals come in an electronic format. We lease the electronic access. We don't own the electrons. So we become the connector to these journals. This is a challenge because we need to work closely with private sector publishers to make sure we can connect to journals that are appropriate and yet recognize that the private sector publishers have a different audience of subscribers. We connect to their literature. We have a third role, and this is the one I'm most excited about, and that is the, the role of the National Library of Medicine as, a, as the discoverer of new things to add to the collection in the moment. You're looking at a database about uh, the experience of, of young children who are exposed to lead, and a new article has come online immediately. How do we find that for you today? You're exploring a database related to Drosophila, and you read, and and it is known that there is a related database about another animal species or another model organism that could be of use to you. How do we search in the moment, help you find and discover without indexing? The idea of the National Library of Medicine's collection, the, those things that we hold, custodian, things that we connect to and things that we discover is a very important and, and expansive role for our future. I'd like to take just a couple minutes to talk to you about what I think is a new type of collection that we will be building over the years the years, and that is collections of models. Increasingly, to support data-driven discovery, we must rely on analytical, computational, simulation, and heuristic models, and even physical models. And yet, the recording of those models, the grammars that describe them, the way we can locate them, is still relegated to published articles and maybe a special site on GitHub, especially if you know the creator of the model. It's time for the National Library of Medicine to begin to think about what does a collection of models look like and what happens when we are not just the collecting of the models but the custodian of them. So collections of models that need to be accessible for research will help us devise computable bio biomedical knowledge which in turn fosters data-driven discovery. And it is in the fostering of data-driven discovery that we believe the future will become brighter in terms of the health we're able to promote. If we think of that models as a foundation of computable biomedical knowledge, we have to recognize the role of the libraries to make these models accessible so we can improve the rigor of current research as it's done by providing well ways to document a model, by expanding the reproducibility of work that is in progress and let it be repeated by others, and by allowing for models to be reused in new circumstances. We've been exploring different strategies that we have in hand already, and two that I want to call your attention to are the RRID, a specialized identifier that it can be used to characterize methods, and the DOIs, which many of you are already familiar with as a way of characterizing objects. The National Library of Medicine does not develop the models, but we make them findable, we make them fair, we make them locatable and usable. We're experimenting with the idea of maybe we should be attaching RRIDs or research resource identifying identifiers to uh, articles that describe what a model was used in it, whether the model is a biological model, such as a cell line or an antibody, or tools such as software or databases that have been used. In addition, RRIDs can be useful to us to uh, to uh, describe to uh, link to excuse me to link to toolkits and pathways and other resources for research. The DOI process, which is a little bit better established, has a little more stability to it, does provide us with a strategy, but DOIs are generally used for, for organizing full objects. Let me show you what this, this looks like today within PubMed. Here we have a citation that's specifically referring to biological models. These are sp specific mouse strings. In the upper left-hand corner, you see the citation with the computable DOI listed in, embedded in the citation. Along the bottom line in the keyword area, you see where the RRIDs for the specific model strings that were used within this research are reported. This allows us to directly access information about the research process. The work of the National Library of Medicine stands in support of developing 
tools that, we, that make it possible for discovery to happen, tools that make it possible for health to improve. But unlike any of our sister institutes and centers at NIH, we don't cure anybody. We don't see any patients. We don't have, pay, we don't have privileges at the clinical center. The National Library of Medicine is one of the 27 institutes and centers at the NIH. All, most of our, all of our sister centers are listed on the side here. We don't cure anything, but I submit to you that a re there has been no discovery in the last 40 years that has been untouched by the resources of the National Library of Medicine. So we've been there along the way and we will continue to be there. Our partnership with the NIH is critical. Now, those of you who've been to Washington can picture us already in the front. On the lower, uh, sorry, the left-hand side of the screen here, you see a diamond-type building with a tall building next to it. That is the National Library of Medicine. We're sort of located on the perimeter of the NIH campus, but we're important to the NIH campus. We're critical to the success of many projects at the NIH campus. So I want to wind up my remarks by telling you how we're participating in the future of the NIH data-driven discovery. <clears throat> Let me first turn to the All of Us Research Program and give you a bit of an update of the All of Us Research Program. The All of Us Research Program is an NIH-wide initiative supported by the director's office to address the discoverability of personalized strategies for care and for health. So the goal of the All of Us Research Program is to enhance the research that will help us understand how to deliver care, deliver therapeutics, deliver intervention, and to enhance positive lifestyles to improve the health of all. The All of Us Research Program it will be in, uh, recruiting individuals through healthcare providing organizations, one of which is located here, also through direct recruitment by um, individuals. And now uh, the recruitment is open and available now. You can go to the website, joinallofus.org, that's listed up here, and sign up yourself if you like. Of the million people that are attempt that are desired to be enrolled, a small a subset of those will provide blood and urine and physiologic samples, and a subset of those will have full genome sequence completed on them. And we will be able to, through these processes, better understand the human condition. The All of Us program is committed to three key tenets that we have yet to see carried out in such a magnitude across the United States. First, representativeness of the population. So the All of Us program is working very hard with very specific strategies to recruit individuals from underrepresented groups. Second, the All of Us strategy is, contribute, is committed to the, part, the experience of individuals as partners in discovery. So the information contributed by the individual will go back to the individual. And third, the All of Us program is committed to a platform of sharing which means no individual institution will be able to hoard their own data, but all data will be brought together and shared and made accessible to the whole cohort. And I believe the first data sets will be open in 19. Is that about around 19? Okay. So not this, not this calendar year, but early next year. The National Library of Medicine is important to the All of Us program because the, the size of the workforce needed to make this work, whether it's individual patients, librarians, clinicians in a hospital, researchers. The size of the workforce exceeds any single institution's ability to actually train that workforce. So we need resources like a library to be made available so researchers know how to access data sets. So patients and participants know what to expect as they're going through the process. Importantly, our National Network of Libraries of Medicine helped in the launch of the All of Us program in May of this year in different places around the country in St. Louis, in New York City, in Detroit, our librarians were in place bringing the concept of health not from a clinical perspective, but from an everyday living perspective. So by its very presence, the National Library of Medicine is helping to, if you will, popularize the idea of precision medicine. In addition, of course, as I mentioned earlier, we're providing education and training tools particularly here at the University of Pittsburgh, our regional medical library is the training and education coordination site for the whole country for the, the All of Us program. This group is developing tools to make sure that patients understand what it means to participate in a study, that researchers know how to access data. They're developing the training to help understand how to return genomic results to an individual. So we have a strong commitment through the All of Us program 
to popularize that is to make science and, and health part of the community and to put the tools in place. The All of Us program is but one of the major initiatives at NIH where data science is becoming the substrate of discovery and of health. So I'd like to take a few minutes to talk to you about the NIH's strategic plan for data science. You'll see the NLM woven through this rather extensively. In 2017, in our appropriation in 2017, Congress directed us to build a strategic plan for data science, recognizing the importance of data as a national resource and recognizing the need to have data available in a way that is safe and secure. Through eight months of study, several teams working together, but the National Library of Medicine deeply participating in this, five goals were identified as part of the strategic plan for data science. First, to develop a, data, a strong data infrastructure. Second, to modernize the data ecosystem. Third, to build advanced data management analytics and tools. Fourth, to enhance workforce development. And fifth, to ad address stewardship and sustainability of our resources. And you'll notice the, the objectives that are laid out underneath each of these pillars. Specific to regional medical libraries, the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, though, are three key areas. First and foremost is to understand under the, the building the modernized data ecosystem the link between clinical, observational, and genomic data. And it is through our partnerships in the community, through understanding what data about a community makes sense, that we will be able to enhance the integration of these. Second, in the second from the right-hand column, the NNLM is important in workforce development. Specifically, they have been running data boot camps, data science boot camps, for librarians to begin to bring the skills to the librarians that their customers, that their clients, their stakeholders are already asking them for. Help us identify where data sets are. How should I find a repository for my data set? What can I learn about my community by looking at public data sets? These are all skills that librarians use, and we're developing the tools, for the, the resources through training through our National Network of Libraries of Medicine. Finally, through stewardship and sustainability, the NNLM and the regional medical libraries are helping us to understand how stewardship occurs in the local community. Increasingly, NIH investigators are expected to deposit, deposit their resource data from their studies into repositories. How do they begin to do that? Those of you who've done research know in those last couple months of a research-funded period, you're scrambling to do everything else. The idea of transferring a data set to a sustainable place where it can be secure and accessed isn't high on the priority list. But partnerships with librarians are what's going to help make possible to have these data sets available. Now you notice that there's some key cross-cutting strategic, uh, cross-cutting themes in this strategic plan, including the need to support common infrastructure and architecture on which more specialized platforms can be built and interconnected. The NLM is not going to become the data repository for the world, but we are going to work with NIH to build the NIH Data Commons, and we are going to be working across our institutions and and research in enterprises around the country who already have data repositories in place to make sure that the, the data result stored in these repositories is accessible and available. NIH has shifted its goals. It's become much more uh, willing to make partnerships for commercial data access, and we expect that this will increase our ability to leverage things that have been developed in, in industry and bring them into research. We will be ensuring that, that biomedical science, data science workforce is, is expanded, including citizens and librarians, and working with community input, too, from the bottom to make sure we build data standards that make sense. We are also committed to working collaboratively with our federal partners around, particularly NOAA and the National Science Foundation. Our first task is to develop a demonstration of a data commons model. So some of you have heard of the um, investments in the commons pilots. The NIH now is investing in moving three high value data sets, the TopMed data set, the um, uh, two of the model organisms data sets, and the GTEx, the genome to tissue data sets, into cloud instances to test out how we port data into these new commercial cloud services, how we develop tools for operating and interrogating them, and how we make them accessible to individuals. The goal with the Data Commons model is not simply to create a repository, but also to pull together what you see down the center line, user authentications, developing APIs for data integration, creating Docker containers and digital object identifiers, 
Making data available means making data available in an efficient and an effective fashion. If you will, watch with me for a brief minute to see what this data future could look like. to say that we're making progress in enhancing the National Library of Medicine's budget. So I want to show by way of illustration and to thank you the growth in our budget in the last few years. In 2017, the NLM's budget was about $406 million. Our omnibus in 2018 was $428 million. And our hope for 2019 will be that last line, the Senate mark, $442 million. Now, you may notice that the President has a little more modest growth view for us, but we're hoping that the Senate and the House prevail and we are actually able to continue to grow because we believe effective, safe use of data will accelerate discovery, will improve human health, and it is the role of the National Library of Medicine to become the trusted <coughs> purveyor and innovation accelerator for the world. I thank you for your time and I've left us some time for questions and comments. Please? I don't see a hand raised, so maybe I could start, uh, Patty. All right. Uh, one. So uh, the panel that I uh, met uh, had one uh, thought that I would appreciate your comment on, and that thought was that uh, we have a lot of data that uh, exists, not just in the NIH and its uh, uh, constituencies and its tributaries, but we have data on health and biology at the FDA, the CDC, the uh, EPA, if it still exists. Uh, still exists for today. And uh, elsewhere in the federal government. We also have a tremendous repository of data in the pharmaceutical industry, in the biotech industry, uh, all of which uh, plays into our ultimate understanding of human biology. Uh, that recommendation, I don't think, appeared in your final uh, 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 articulation, but I wondered if you could comment on the notion. Oh, okay. So the, the what, what Art is referring to is the recognition that data are, are already, there, there are many sto data stores around the federal government, in the FDA, in um, the EPA, uh, obviously in, um, in CMS there's data, there's claims data. There's also data in, in pharma, privately held data. There's also data in hospitals and clinics, all of which could help us better understand human health. And, and the challenge, and it is in there, you just can't see it because I modified it just a little bit to make it palatable. Um, the challenge is... To make it politically correct. I said palatable. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the challenge is, is it data integration and at what point. So we are committed to building the tools for interoperability, to building the resources for data of the future. Now the debate that we got into was the amount of data stores that already exist that could be potentially valuable will in themselves take an enormous effort to expose and enormous political will from some of our private institutions, healthcare as well as pharma. Uh, so the, the, the NLM strategic plan is slightly more oriented towards saying in the future we will promulgate standards for fairness, we will build tools to make data fair, we will build the pathways for the policy of data access and use, the identity management, etc that will make the future access to data more uh, feasible. The existing data sets, so we recognize that, um, particularly with our partners with FDA and CDC, there is a, there's a critical need to be able to integrate those data sets. 
So I'm very pleased to be able to say that new leadership at CMS has opened up access to CMS data in a way heretofore not made accessible. We are, as our are other agencies, experimenting with that. And next week, the ONC is bringing together leadership from the NLM, from CDC, and from FDA to actually start beginning to discuss how do we address these. Now, any of you who've worked with Sentinel or with any of the other data sets are going to tell me right away, don't even touch that stuff. There's a junk in it, or it's a problem. And I, I will let will say, our, my confidence in emerging methodology suggests that our belief that the only good data is individually collected data is going to be actually fall away. We have tools that will allow us for, to be able to do better imputation, better tolerance for error and variability. So instead of, of smoothing out the uncertainty in data sets, we will actually be able to leverage it. Now, I'm going to tell you one problem that you all may be able to help us with, and that is the tension that's going to arise between institutionally held data, which is currently well-funded, well, it's partially well-funded under NIH grants and contracts, in contrast with NIH-based data repositories. And we have a future coming where many of our institutions, and certainly there's one in Pennsylvania that begins with a P, but it's on the other side of the state, that has <laughs> built a very large repository, and they'd like their faculty to keep using that repository. So we're going to have to come to some um, uh, rapprochement about how institution investments in data and rightly sized requirements to leverage data for the economic value are balanced with the national need for data sharing. And I, I don't have that answer, but I'd like you to be part of that conversation. So I'll use the microphone. Oh, okay, thanks. Uh, so two questions. Uh, thank you very much for restoring the training program slots. Yeah, <laughs> you're very a, welcome. There's a deluge of need for well-trained data science biomedical implementations, etc. So thank you for that. I wanted to start out. Thank with you. That. I appreciate the two that. The questions are this. How do we get the libraries and biomedical informatics programs innovating together better? Um, I sense that biomedical informatics and the library programs are fairly siloed. And the second question is, um, most of the other NIH institutes are making strong plays on getting more money into RPGs, R1s, program projects, etc. You know, NLM has uh, work to catch up on that. What is your plan for uh, fundamental research science in the NLM? And, and the easy question is... <laughs> okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this, the, the first question first, which is how do we build bridges between schools of library information studies uh, or information sciences and biomedical informatics training programs. Uh, well, this summer we released an administrative supplement opportunity so our biomedical informatics training programs could partner with library schools in their institutions to develop any type of innovative training. We left it open for a couple of <clears throat> a couple of um, pro a couple of opportunities because. There's, a, there's a, a fundamental challenge here. Our biomedical informatics training programs train researchers, and their focus is to develop the research skilled professional, pre-doc and post-doc. Our library science training programs develop practitioners. They don't develop researchers in the same way. So we have to build a bridge that goes two ways. And frankly, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the proposals that come in. But often we find the bridge gets built two-thirds of the way one way or two-thirds of the way the other way and not completely. So I'd like to see them built more. Um, we, we recognize that uh, we, we have a desperate need for library science knowledge, especially for understanding curation, metadata, systematic collection. A lot of the things that we, already, we need for data, librarians already know how to do. So I, for one, do not want to sacrifice our MLS prepared workforce so that we all become data science support people. And at the same time, we do need to have support individuals here. So we are advocating for a, a, a pathway with several off-ramps for data science training. The associate degree level data, if you will, uh, data services person, the bachelor's program data wrangler, the master's degree program data synthesis person. So we recognize that this is a team sport with a lot of different training. We are partnering with NSF to do some of this training because our mandate doesn't extend to the undergraduate and high school training. However, we did release another administrative supplement this year 
for our, excuse me, to encourage diversity in our workforce because we know our scientific workforce in biomedical bodies tends to be very pale and very male. So we have to find ways to bring the, make this more diverse. In order to do that, we, we're encouraging our, our training programs again. So we start with our, our successful training programs to say, partner with a historically black college or a minority serving institution in your area and build a pathway in. Now the pathway doesn't have to end up in a degree in your school, but maybe exposure, I'm sorry, degree from maybe exposure, maybe early training and helping people find an offering. So we're looking forward to those <coughs> initiatives. Um, Barbara pointed out to me though that, that actually there, there's library schools of, and their names are changing radically as we hear even here. There's uh, biomedical informatics programs and sometimes they're in departments, sometimes they're not, and sometimes they're a training grant, and sometimes they're just a collection of people who work together, and sometimes not. So, but the third leg of that stool are the practicing librarians in an area. And so we, we must re-energize re the connection between the practice of librarians in library science and the academic training of them. And that's been a, sl a little slower to pick up, so organizations like the Medical Library Association, like Amy, are ways I look forward to that. Now, Mike wants money. I've never visited Mike that he hasn't talked about money with me. I've got a good boss. <laughs> this is a very fair question. And when I first went to the National Library of Medicine, it's the strangest job to get hired for. I, I only spoke with one of my direct reports, and they didn't show me the budget before I took the job. <laughs> you know, I got to tell you, don't do that. It's just, <laughs> um, so, and, and, and I was very lucky. So I say, we have a half a billion dollar enterprise going on. This is pretty big after a kid who managed a three million dollar a year research budget. It's a lot of money. But 86% of our funds are tied to making sure you have PubMed at your fingertips. And dbGaP is open all the time. And that we have training at the National Network. So that means only about 14% of our money is in the extramural program. So when I came, I'm thinking, I'm, and I've been a biomedical informaticist for 34 years. And I came thinking, I am coming to the research powerhouse, and I took a look at that budget, and I saw our entire research enterprise, intramural and extramural, training and RPGs, $70 million max. That's it, out of, out of $450 million. So, um, so my first statement is, we're gonna, I'm, I'm committed to, to changing this. Um, our, our extramural program budget right now runs about, is running at about $46 million. Two, 10 years ago, it was $66 million. So we've lost ground because of many important decisions that had to be made to make sure the library resources continue to serve, but it costs the research money. So I am absolutely committed, I work with Valley Farms, I'm absolutely committed to double the extramural budget, which will only take us from about 46 million to about 92 million in, in, in my five years. But if I can guess that far, I'll be pretty pleased. <clears throat> so far I've added eight million to it since I've been there. So if I can add eight million Every two years, and well, it's still not going to be enough, but it'll be closer. <laughs> <coughs> but I'm very fortunate with Valerie because I said, I, I, and I, I, we've had tremendous support from uh, Dr. Collins and the NIH leadership. We've put together a plan, a research vision plan that involves new program project grants, involves new partnerships around uh, research collaborations with NSF to de-bias data because we know about the biases that are in many of our genomic data sets. Um, an increased number of center grants to allow for clusters of people to work together. So we, pro we proposed a scale 30 million, 60 million, 100 million research enterprise over five years. And I'm ready to go and try and sell it. My dad worked for the Catholic missions. He could get money out of stone. I think we might be able to get this. But I'm going to need your support. And I'm going to be coming back and saying we need stories. We need to be able to tell this. But I, we've got a plan. We've got the, the structure of it. Our intramural program has also suffered. Um, the NCBI has an intramural division called the Comp Computational Biology Branch. The Lister Hill Center has an intramural research project. Together, they don't add up to $30 million. It's not enough. The questions that a research laboratory, a federal research laboratory can answer about curation, about analytics, about AI, about better interfaces, about virtual reality as a mechanism for changing health, we must have investment in there. So we have just completed a blue ribbon panel uh, headed by our colleague Russ Altman. So this is, the, the review is, is going to be out, actually be in my hands on Friday of this week. Um, 
I believe what they're going to tell me is you have to stop doing one-offs. So we have one of everyone. We have 20 investigators. We've got one of everything you could possibly want to cover. Not enough. We have to start building depth. We'll have to pick priority areas. So we're going to impanel a research visioning team to get that in place within the next year because I, I'm putting $5 million in, into the intramural program this in fiscal 19. Um, we're hiring four new investigators, which, will take, which is, this sounds like it's 20% it's new, new growth in our investigators, but it's only four people, so it's not, I don't know, that, not enough. Uh, but with each of those four people, I've put together four other positions, a scientist, an analyst, a, a tech person, um, and a, um, basically a data manager. So we now have 16 new people coming. So this is going to be a, bol a bolus into our intramural program. So we've got small steps. The big steps are going to come very honestly from a political conversation around the BD2K investment. And the original BD2K investment was anticipated to be $150 million a year. After the first phase was resolved and the, um, and the programs were uh, pivoted to things, demonstration projects like the, the, the Commons pilots, there was a, there remained on the table money that has yet to be committed, and I'm going after that money. So I, I think we, we could get there. We have, because of the All of Us program and our partnership there, because of the Commons Pilots, our cachet on the campus has grown hugely in two years. And I, I attribute this to Steve Sherry, Jim Ostell, and Amanda Wilson. I mean, we've got people who are out there serving as a face of NLM. So I think we're going to do it. Watch me. <laughs> um, other questions? I think we have time for maybe one more. One more. Okay, thanks, sir. Thank you. more of a comment and a question. Sure. But on your, at the end, you have the future and you have this cloud of things that have been yeah. One of them is use of authentication. Yes. So as an example, you said multiple times that the gap is kind of... Clunky? ...having trouble because, yes. you know, you need to get more and more. When you apply for a DB gap, data set, it takes about two to three months. Yes. When you apply for the second one, you have to do the exact same process again. It doesn't recognize that you've had one before. So it's like you know applying for a driver's license every time you want to drive a car. Yes. So it is, and, and I, I think this is great. This it's moving at such a fast pace. This you know access to data and data sets that tackling these things I think is, is really important. I think it's great what you're doing. So Steve Sherry has headed up a new a group this past year called AIM, the Identity Access Management, which is going to take the ERA, because right now you use ERA to access the media, to move beyond ERA to provide role. Sorry. Um, moving from role-based authentication and access management to uh, use-based authentication and access management. So you'll have a substrate for your role and then the individual um, uh, data sets you want to access. And sometimes you want to access several at the same time will be, will be the smaller delta. So that's point number one. Point number two, thank you all of you, who, all of you who have responded to our RFIs that have come out for a number of different things, including how to make DBGAT better. NIH has just invested a significant amount on Friday into this, so I'm expecting about $2 million of better interface design. It's not going to fix the back end yet. And some of the challenges with DBGAP have to do with the NIH data sharing policy, which we're also working on. But at least I can tell you we'll clean up the technical piece. And thank you for your patience. So one more, uh, one more round of applause for an excellent <laughs>